Right, so in our last session we were looking at the false prophet and saw how once again the papacy is beginning to develop as a power again, influencing Europe, influencing the beast system that is arising in Europe, the foot that is growing on the bottom of the image forming uh, in the west. Uh, we're going to be now looking at the east side, the eastern leg, and the development of the eastern foot. So we know from Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon was the symbol that John was uh, given to describe the Roman world of his day. And it takes us back to the Garden of Eden because there is this phrase in Revelation chapter 20, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So it's speaking to us in Brother Thomas's uh, cryptic phrase, sin manifested politically. Sin began in the Garden of Eden and then began to manifest itself in the kingdoms of men in opposition to the things of God. And in John's day, the dragon was the symbol for the political system of his day, the Roman Empire. So these, this system opposes the truth. And John was on the Isle of Patmos when he had this revelation and uh, he was given this description in chapter 12 of this uh, beast that uh, a wonder in heaven, a red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So what is the origin of that dragon power? Well, that's taken straight from Daniel and chapter 7. If we go back to Daniel chapter 7 and look at the beasts and if we count up the number of heads that are there, we have one head on the Babylonian lion, one on the Medo-Persian bear, four on the Grecian leopard, one on the Roman fourth beast. Uh, added together, that makes seven heads. And there were ten horns, which were all on that uh, one beast. So seven heads and ten horns is linking us back to the progression of beasts, the uh, how God viewed what Nebuchadnezzar saw as the mighty image God sees as these different creatures, and that, that links us on. John is in this Roman fourth beast period, which incorporates all that has gone before it. All the wrong thinking is there. So it's an amalgam of Daniel's four beasts. And so it, it was uh, described as a red dragon, um, pagan Rome. It, it ceased to be pagan in the time of Constantine, and that's what Revelation chapter 12 is all about, the change from uh, a, a pagan Roman world to a so-called Christian Roman world. And it's uh, telling us about the exploits of Constantine and how that red dragon was, was subdued uh, and changed. And John was told that he was in the, um, the sixth of the seventh heads that were on this beast, this dragon. And we can look at history and work out what the different heads were, I'm not going to particularly uh, look at this, but John was living under the time of the imperial, uh, when the Caesars were there, uh, and that lasted until about AD 476. That head was to be wounded, and a seventh head come, the Goths were going to come in, the barbarians, uh, and that was only going to last for nearly 100 years, and then that would disappear with the sixth head being revived again, uh, leading to the Holy Roman Empire uh, and going on to the time periods that we were looking at uh, yesterday. And then the, clearly there is a latter day manifestation, an eighth head, it's described as an eighth head, which is the sixth head revived for a second time. So it, it shows us there's a continuity in this kingdoms of men, this Roman beast system, uh, and we look to see how that is revealed in these last days. We just uh, want to just put in a little interlude here and just show the movement of the centre of the military might of Rome because this has a great bearing in what we're going to look at. 
So in uh, the days beyond uh, John receiving the revelation, when the world had become a, a Christian empire, Constantine moved the center of his government to Constantinople, rebuilt the city, uh, Byzantine, uh, rebuilt it and named it after himself. And this became the seat of the government. This is where the emperor was. This is where the military armies were. He, he moved it across to Constantinople because he saw that the eastern side was the most troublous part and Rome was a long way to bring armies across. So this was a movement of the centre of, of military might, the imperial government, uh, across to Constantinople. And uh, so it changed its name from Byzantium to Constantinople, and of course today it's the city of Istanbul in Turkey. And the removal of that government from the old original city of Rome allowed Rome to flourish. So the original Rome was known as the first Rome, and this uh, new Rome was known as the second Rome in history. And that continued, as we know, until 1453, when uh, Constantinople was uh, overthrown. So the shifting, this is from a, a book, The Root of Europe, the shifting of the centre of gravity, politically as well as economic, was acknowledged by 330, by the foundation of Constantinople as the new Rome, twin capital of the reconstituted empire, as it emerged from the reforms of Diocletian and Constantine, those were emperors. So this was now the new base for Rome, Rome II, so the second Rome. Um, sorry, I was uh, reading from my advanced slide, and well, that, was, that was the slide there. Um, so uh, what then happened was in 1453, when the Ottoman Turks came along, all that crumbled. But the Orthodox Church moved its centre upwards to Moscow uh, and established itself after a little time. It wandered a few places but then settled on Moscow and the Orthodox uh, Church became the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and centred there. And the political powers that belonged originally to Rome and then to Constantinople were absorbed into Moscow. And Moscow was known as the Third Rome. And... It was there that the dragon uh, was moved, uh, and that is where the dragon is at the moment. We are waiting the final stage for the dragon to return back to Constantinople. That may not happen until uh, the armies of Russia come down as Gogun forces into the land of Israel. But we know that the Russians very much want to have control of Constantinople. They've tried in the past, Crimean Wars and First World War, to regain control of Constantinople. They see that as the origins of their religion and the origins of their imperial aspects. So they want to retake it. That's why it's so fascinating to see the interplay between Mr. Putin and Mr. Erdogan, the president of Turkey at the moment. Russia has his eyes on that country. So going back to our image uh, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 2, the eastern leg became, it was the dragon power, and we have to see a foot and toes growing, and we see that at the moment, in order that the image can stand. And so in Revelation chapter 16, when we see the dragon power, then this is a power which we can see and identify today uh, as the successor of the old Roman system. So Russia did take over the symbolism, the double-headed eagle. It took over the religion of Constantinople. It took over the czars, the rulership, the Caesars, uh, and its military leadership. So, it, and the interesting thing is how today Russia is seeking the cooperation of Rome, the Pope, the Pope and Putin are great friends, they met many times, and they are working together to control things. And the two legs are beginning to cooperate together. 
So just reminding ourselves of what was spoken in Daniel chapter 7 about the little horn that uh, appeared, the papal system, which was uh, diverse. Uh, it, it described the situation as having teeth which were of iron, nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. So again, we have this linking, as we did, with the band around the tree of iron and brass. Greek and Roman, Russian and Roman. And there is this coming together of these powers at the time of the end to cooperate together to come against God's people. And so we have headlines like uh, Azar is born, this is from The Economist uh, a couple of months ago. Um, Moscow is the third Rome and due to the lack of a second Rome, relations with the first Rome are very important to us. That was um, a commentator way back uh, 10 years ago. But that's interesting that Moscow sees the importance of a cooperation with the first Rome because the second Rome is uh, under the control of Turkey. So it's interesting to see the number of times that Putin has visited the popes and uh, John Paul II, he visited in 2000 and 2003. He visited Benedict in 2007. Uh, he visited Pope Francis 2013, 2015, and is due back there next month. There's a, an art exhibition in the Vatican that Putin's coming to open, and uh, they've arranged another meeting. They've got a lot of work to do together. And so we see pictures like this of Putin and the Pope working together. The Pope has given up on being able to work with the United States, uh, and has decided that the only person that he can work with to uphold Christianity is Putin because Putin has declared that he is the defender of Christianity uh, and so the two are seeing eye to eye and are beginning to work together. So this is an article from uh, the America which is uh, a Jesuit magazine, uh, 1st of September. This developing friendship with Putin uh, well, the headline, How the Vatican is Encouraging Dialogue Between Russia and the West. This developing friendship with Putin uh, had been matched by an ever-improving relationship between the Russian Orthodox Church, with its 150 million members, and the Holy See, uh, the Catholic Church. Pope Francis has played a huge role in this with his approach to the Orthodox Church and his willingness to meet with Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. Relations between the Moscow Patriarch and the Holy See have been encouraged by President Putin, who has embraced the Orthodox faith, not only at a personal level, but also as part of his effort to consolidate his power at home. Last year, Patriarch Kirill and Pope Francis met in Havana in February. That was a, a big step, wasn't it, when the two leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church met together in Cuba and embraced and promised to work together. And Pope Francis has been working very hard to try and set up a, a visit from, of himself to Moscow. That, that's his goal, to be able to go and visit Moscow. Here's another magazine, this is uh, Modern Diplomacy, which gives it an even broader picture. Vatican, Moscow and China a new global religious and spiritual hegemony. Pope Francis is no longer very interested in the Eastern Schism and its doctrinal, theological and strategic connotation. If anything, Pope Francis is interested in new alliance between Russia, the Catholic Church of Rome and, in the future, China, so as to put, to an, end, put an end to the Vatican and the Atlantic axis between Western Europe and the United States. In other words, he's given up on, say, an alliance with uh, America. America isn't prepared to come to defend the persecuted Christians in the Middle East, whereas Putin is. So he's, he's moved the church's alliance to an alliance with Moscow uh, and working hard on bringing China in as well. 
So when Foreign Minister Lavrov, whom Cardinal Secretary of State met in Moscow, a clear agreement was reached quickly. The Russian forces de facto protection of all religious minorities in the Middle East. So the Pope can depend on Putin to come to the help of persecuted Christians. Catholics in Russia are few, only about 800,000 of them, only 0.5% of the total population. Nevertheless, the true strategic aim is not the number, but the quality of the Vatican and Russian joint strategic actions. The goal is exactly Pope Francis' visit to Russia. It will be the seal of a Catholic church that, as at the time of Pope John Paul II, anticipates and overcomes the end of the Cold War, and thus a visiting the, a link between the Vatican and the emerging power of the Eurasian heartland. A system envisaging Patriarch Tyrrell as the world leader of the Orthodox Church and Pope Francis as the world inevitable leader of Catholicism, designed to build, also after the agreement with the Chinese government, a sort of a new global religious and spiritual hegemony outside the subjection to the westernization for the Vatican. Furthermore, the schism which exists between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church could be doctrinally overcome with a statement that Patriarch Kirill has already suggested in which it is accepted that the Pope, the Patriarch of Rome, is the Protos, the first, among the Patriarchs of the other churches on the basis of a document discussed in 2008 on the island of Crete regarding the history and identity of the churches before and after the Great Schism. So, in other words, the, the groundwork has already been done. Uh, Kirill is ex uh, prepared to accept that the Pope is number one of the uh, leaders. Uh, and that is all that uh, is needed for the two churches to come together. Uh, and we know for the image to stand upon its feet, the East and West have to come together, not only in military terms, but in spiritual terms. The eyes and the mouth, um, there has to be one mouth, and that's going to be the Pope, two eyes, two churches perhaps, um, but this coming together of the two. So what Francis has been doing uh, in the past few years is building up these links with the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, there is a bit of resistance because uh, the Roman Catholic Church is so big and they're comparatively uh, small um, in the total number of uh, believers and so there is a bit of caution there. But things are moving and uh, back in August of this year the uh, Vatican um, Secretary of State, number two in the Vatican, uh, went to Russia, high profile visit to see Mr. Putin, see Patriarch Kirill and that, and uh, they got on very well. The meetings were truly characterized by a cordial, listening and respectful climate. I would define them as important and constructive encounters. Uh, and what the Pope had done, he had softened up the preparations for this visit by sending to Russia the bones of Father Christmas. Um, Saint Nicholas, uh, who is in, you know, the world is celebrating uh, his mass, uh, is a Russian saint, and his bones and his relics, way back in history, 1087, were seized from uh, the uh, Greek Orthodox Church and seized by the Roman Catholic Church uh, and have been held in Rome ever since. And uh, Saint Nicholas uh, is a very highly uh, thought of saint in Russia, is their number one. So what Pope Francis said was, right, I'll let you have the bones, I'll loan the bones, the relics of St. Nicholas, uh, and they can come to uh, Russia, which they did. Uh, and you can see in the picture there the veneration of the so-called relics of a so-called saint. We know it's all so utterly obnoxious in the eyes of God, but if you've ever been into a Russian Orthodox church, you will see the utter devotion that especially the women have 
uh, of this, all the relics and the bits and bobs. Uh, it's, it's, it turns the heart. But they were so keen to see these that they were prepared to wait 20 hours and the weather, uh, well, it was May time, so it wouldn't be snow on the ground, but it was a long way. But they were prepared to wait 20 hours just to see part, file past these relics of Father Christmas. And it, it, it helped because it, it puts the uh, Pope Francis in a good light. And so when eventually uh, Lavrov and went, he was highly uh, acclaimed and uh, they had a very good meeting. So, looking now at the work of Putin, um, Putin's close, this is so again the headline, Are New Middle Eastern Alliances Reshaping the Region? This is back in September. Putin's close associates are now talking about a major change in the Russian president's position centred on the need for a strategic alliance between the Muslims and the Romans. The Romans in Putin's eyes being the Orthodox Russians, with the Russian Orthodox Church as their centre of gravity. Russia sees itself as a guardian of Orthodox Christians in the world, mainly in the Middle East. The proposed alliance extends from Constantinople, present Istanbul, to Moscow and includes Russia, Iran and Turkey. So that's wonderful, isn't it? Because that's, that's what we're expecting. The nations described in Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, he is talking about this new alliances between uh, Turkey uh, and Russia uh, and the Middle East and Iran. The new alliance will help prevent the fall of Syria into the hands of American allies, including preventing the establishment of a Kurdish state. It seems that Erdogan shares the same vision with Putin as can be seen from their cooperation during the, the talks uh, that were on the peace uh, talks back in September time. So here we have a situation of uh, a latter-day uh, expression of the power of the uh, little horn of the goat, the military might of the Roman Empire, which, as I say, moved up to Russia, to the Third Rome, uh, and we now see it in its latter-day manifestation. Uh, and it, it's, it's prospering, uh, and it is seeking to uh, bring about, through a deception, bringing peace. But that peace is going to be a false peace. It's going to lead them to stand up against the prince of princes, but is going to be broken without hand. Uh, and what we're beginning to see is the forming of the eastern foot and toes, the movement of nations from their existing positions into the correct leg, as it were. Some nations have got to be attached to the western leg, some to the eastern leg, some are in the western leg and got to be moved across. Uh, and this is what we're seeing in the forming of this military power of Russia, which is going to cooperate with the West, and the Vatican very much driving what is going on. So this is Europe of today. If we go back to the time when the Roman Empire was divided, uh, the countries shaded in the bottom right there uh, were the countries which were in the eastern Roman Empire, uh, and the Western Roman Empire came up to France and covered a, a kind of area there. And all we can do is to look at that map and say, well, that was the division between the uh, Eastern leg and the Western leg uh, in time past, and presumably that guides us as to where the divisions are going to lie in the future. And so, you know, we can, but extend an imaginary line upwards and think, well, the nations on this side are going to belong to this western leg, and the countries on that side are going to belong to the eastern one. So there are countries uh, that uh, are, are there which have got to be pulled across and uh, belong to uh, the eastern leg. So countries like Belarus and Ukraine 
which have got a degree of independence, have got to be more brought under the control of Russia, which is not a very happy situation as far as Ukraine is concerned. We know the problems that are happening there, but it seems reasonable that Ukraine comes under the control uh, of Russia. And then countries which at the moment are a part of the EU, countries like Romania and Bulgaria, again, they've got to be drawn back because they're attached to the wrong foot, as it were. And what's so interesting is to see how today, uh, although they're members of the EU, those two countries are very unhappy. They've had to give up an awful lot in order to join the EU, and things haven't worked out. It hasn't been a payment of gold for them being a member of the EU, far from it. Uh, and increasingly, one's reading accounts of how they are thinking, well, maybe we haven't done the right thing. Maybe we ought to orientate towards Russia. And of course, Russia is working behind the scenes, uh, trying to influence them to turn them. So it is quite interesting to see the, the grip that uh, uh, Russia is, is working to bring these countries over to herself. Uh, and Greece, likewise, you know, been a member of the EU for a long time. But increasingly today, the Greeks look to Russia for their salvation because they've been so badly dealt with by the EU. They've been brought to almost uh, uh, ruin economically through the policies which the EU has because uh, their economy doesn't fit in with the Euro system that they are in. Uh, countries like uh, Cyprus and Crete, well that's Crete and there's Cyprus there, uh, they too uh, are beginning to look to Russia and Russia is working more and more with these countries to try and draw them, to attract them uh, to her side, as it were. Not that it matters terribly much because these two legs are going to cooperate together, but it is so fascinating to be able to look out and see the angels working behind the scenes to ensure that there are two legs with their two feet uh, attached in these two centres of Rome and Constantinople. Uh, Turkey, too, is uh, very much now being brought into the orbit of Russia. So we see, going on the past few years, there's this uh, long movement of nations. And this was an article from Stratfor uh, back in August time. Uh, the front line drawn across Russia's backyard. Globalisation has changed how we think about time, space and distance, but geography is still the same where it counts, national security. The former Soviet states lining Russia's border know this better than most, since their proximity to the eastern giant renders them more vulnerable to Moscow's hybrid warfare tactics than countries further afield. Nations like Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova sit on the front line of Russia's lasting battle with the West for influence in the international system. And they are the countries most at risk of being caught in the crossfire. Russia's goal within the first tier of states is simple, to weaken the Western in West's influence while strengthening its own. One way of doing this is to undermine less friendly governments and restore more neutral or allied ones. Another is to block or even reverse these states' integration with the Western blocs, such as the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. Should Moscow successfully pull one of these pro-Western states under its umbrella, it would no longer be a prime target for Russian meddling. But if countries such as Belarus, Armenia and Azerbaijan were to join forces with the West, they would quickly find themselves in the Kremlin's crosshairs. In other words, Russia is working to do exactly what Scripture said uh, would happen that these borderline countries are being targeted by Russia to pull them under the Soviet influence. So as I said, uh, Bulgaria and Romania are one of the unhappiest members of the EU. Many Romanians have uh, moved from Bulgaria because of all the problems. So let's just look at Greece and how Greece is being drawn, how Russia works to uh, attract these nations. Doesn't matter, the member of the EU, we can influence circumstances. Now, 
Greek unemployment rates are absolutely staggering. Um, at least uh, 25, 27%, uh, where are we today, 2007, about 21% of the population of Greece is unemployed. And that's a vast drain on the resources, people just with no jobs to do, living in great poverty. And if one looks at the young people, um, back in January, 51% of the young people had no job, never had a job. Uh, it's not much better, 44%. So, you know, it, it's, it's a terrible drag. And that makes Greece a target for countries like Russia to come along. The EU is saying austerity, austerity, austerity. Russia can come along and say, well, we'll help you. We'll invest some money in your industry. We'll take over your uh, ports and that kind of thing, put money into you. And the cartoonists just have it so beautifully, just three cartoons are just dragged. You know, the EU is really just pushing Greece into the hands of Turkey. And here's another one, um, you know, asking for money. The EU walks away and there is Putin saying, here's a little gift from me. And poor old stick-thin uh, Greece, uh, Russia's saying, come on, come and work with me. Yeah. And just uh, last month, downloaded, it's absolutely fascinating, about a 20-page article, uh, The Kremlin's Trojan Horses, I'll, I'll give you the link afterwards, uh, Russian influence in Greece, Italy and Spain. And it sets out just how Russia is working um, behind the scenes, influence who gets elected and all that kind of thing, to drag them into her orbit. So this was the section on um, Greece. Greece, still the EU's weak link. Russia has always had a strong and sometimes reciprocated interest in Greece. From the birth of modern Greece during uh, 1821 revolution against the Ottoman Turk to its contemporary relations with Greeks, a ruleist leftist Syriz party and through their mutual support of orthodox Christian institutions, Russia has found Greece open to a strategic relationship rooted in historic, cultural, and religious connections. See, the, the thing about Greece is she's a Greek orthodox country. Virtually the rest of the EU is Catholic. So she's always been an odd one out. And here's Russia saying, well, look, you know, you link to us through religion. We're the same religion, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, you know, we're together. Um, in the long run, this means ultimately creating an alliance between Athens and Moscow and undermining Greece's affiliation with the Western liberal democratic values and institutions. Putin himself is active in the direct overtures to Greece. He has made it a personal project to engage orthodox religious institutions, meet with the Greek political leadership, and pursue any availing business opportunities in the country. So he's been working hard. Uh, and the Greek leader admits that the strategic choice of his party is to improve Greco-Russian relations. So he sees the future for Greece lies in us working with Russia rather than the EU. So that was, that was quite interesting. So what about Turkey? Turkey is uh, a country which has had a uh, very checkered history under this uh, leader who is wanting to turn Turkey, put the clock back and make it into a very Muslim-led country. He's had his spats with Russia um, back in 2015 when they shot down a Russian plane. Uh, Putin imposed very strong uh, sanctions upon Turkey uh, and uh, things were very grim for quite a time. But <coughs> We're still here. Right. Um, Ergadan eventually apologised, sent a letter of apology, um, and things are, have improved considerably. And uh, 
This uh, meeting just a couple of weeks ago was the eighth meeting this year between Putin and Erdogan. So there's uh, things are on a footing. You see, Putin uses carrots and sticks. When he can't get his way, he uses sticks to beat them. But where he can get his way, well, then he uses carrots to encourage them. Uh, and one of the big carrots, of course, is energy. Turkey is a big consumer of energy. And this Turk stream, we remember that originally this uh, pipeline was uh, going to go straight into Bulgaria and up into the EU, taking Russian gas into the EU. But because of all the problems which the EU made about um, the difficulties of having a dependence upon Russian gas, uh, Putin suddenly decided, well, he had enough of the EU, I'll send my gas to Turkey, and hence the strange little kink, uh, which then takes it down into Turkey. Now, that line is under construction. They're hoping to have the first uh, gas flowing into Turkey uh, at the end of 2019. No, 2018, it's not that in time. Can't read my notes. So, um, it, it, once a country is dependent upon you for energy, you then very much fall under its control because Putin's only got to turn the tap and you've got no gas and that's uh, your uh, countrymen don't think very much of you if as a leader you've got no heat and gas. So it, it's his, his method of influencing Turkey. Uh, I mean, they, there is an existing pipeline. Turkey does already have uh, gas from Russia, but this greatly increases the amount of gas. But see where they have put it. This is the industrial end of Turkey, uh, and the pipeline goes right up to the Greek border because Putin is anticipating that Greece will soon come under his control, and so, right, we just extend the gas pipeline across into Greece, and then Greece can have Russian gas as well. He is a master chess player, and he puts his pieces in the right places, and then just waits until the right time comes. Turkey has upset the West because she is uh, in NATO. She has the second largest army in NATO, and yet she is now beginning to purchase Russian arms. She's seeking to um, manufacture Russian Klasnov uh, rifles in Turkey. Um, but she's also purchasing an S-400 uh, uh, anti-aircraft missile defense system. This is what Russia puts in all over the place in Syria and uh, on the borders of uh, Europe in order to defend her aircraft from missile attacks. And here is Turkey going against NATO wishes and American wishes uh, and putting in uh, Russian uh, S-400 system. So that uh, doesn't put Turkey in a very good light as far as the West is concerned. It pulls her into the uh, Russian orbit. And what is being talked about, uh, according to the Eurasian Times a couple of weeks ago, is that as part of the agreement for uh, putting in this system, that Russia will be allowed to have a military base in Turkey. That will be a real cream on the uh, situation as far as Russia is concerned, if that was possible. We shall see. Uh, as with many of these things, things don't go smoothly. Uh, they had expected to have signed the, uh, the purchase of this S-400, and even though the deposit's been uh, paid, uh, there was the final signing of the document when he went uh, last week, uh, and it became apparent that they weren't quite prepared to uh, sign it, so the table with all the paperwork was whipped away and they carried on with their meeting. So, Ukraine, uh, it's having a tough time, uh, economically, very bad situation, and one can see very easily how it could fall into Russia's hands. But again, one sees how Russia is working, because to the west of Ukraine is a little 
uh, area, let's put the bigger map on, is Moldova. Moldova is a little sliver of a country between Romania and Ukraine, and there is yet another little sliver on the right-hand side um, of that. Now, Russia has bases in Romania, uh, and I uh, don't know why that one's come up there, but never mind. Oh, that's because the map's not come up. Yeah, so in, here we've got the map with the... There's a little uh, sliver of Transnistra, uh, if I pronounce that correctly. So Moldova is very much now under the influence of uh, a pro-Russian leader, uh, and this little strip of land uh, has always been under Russian influence, and Russia has had a base there for quite a time, uh, and has enlarged the base so that, as far as Ukraine is concerned, she's not only lost part of the east, she's lost Crimea, and she's got Russia sitting on her western border. So um, it, it is part of uh, Russia's movement uh, across here. Russia also has got a base to the north, in, in Russian territory, to the north of Ukraine. That was established in 2016. And again in 2016, an old existing base was very much enlarged so that uh, Russian troops could be in big quantity uh, on the northern border of Ukraine. Uh, we know in 2014 and uh, to this, uh, this year that Russian troops have taken over the eastern part of the Ukraine uh, and established a military presence there. Um, and down in uh, Crimea, down, uh, there's the, uh, the detail of the eastern zone. Um, we've got brothers and sisters in that region. Life is very difficult for them under back under Russian control uh, and they have to, when they go to visit the brothers and sisters who are over in the Ecclesia over here, they have to change their currency and uh, it, it's, it's very difficult for them. We have to remember them in our prayers. But Crimea has been turned into uh, an advanced naval and military aircraft base uh, bristling with Russian military. Uh, a lot of money has been poured into there in the past uh, year or two. Um, also, the, the linkage, this is uh, uh, a little land link that links it to the Ukraine, um, so that as far as the Russians are concerned, there is no land access, because that goes straight into Ukraine. There are a series of bridges over islands, but again, that goes into Ukraine. So what Russia has been spending a lot of money in doing is building a bridge across this, uh, the back end there. So uh, at the moment, they are busy building a bridge linking uh, Russia, mainland Russia, to this island. There's a, a ferry existing, um, but they're building this rail bridge to uh, go across, and uh, that's quite a spectacular uh, feat of engineering. So Russia uh, has been advancing uh, let's just put those uh, bases that we already looked at on there. She's also been working in this region of Georgia. Remember in 2008, she establishes bases in Abkhazia and uh, Ossetia. And again, been working over the years to uh, make those bases stronger. Uh, on the other side of the mountain range there, she's uh, established a forward base in Russian territory so that when the time comes to move her troops forward, uh, she's got troops there that can come through uh, the pass. There's only a couple of passes through the mountain ranges there. She's got Russian troops on this side of them, so no problem for them rolling onwards. So we can see uh, great changes, and even Georgia itself is now being so heavily pressurised. Georgia was originally going to become part of the West, but now... Uh, the headline there, Georgia, Russia, furthering ties with new trade routes. Um, so Russia is beginning to tie Georgia, the rest of the country, uh, tie her to herself. So Russia, very active uh, in that region there. 
Just going up northwards uh, in Belarus, he's got a base, and there's a little enclave, uh, uh, Kaliningrad, Kaliningrad, uh, and she has uh, a very strong base there. In fact, if we put the map on, it's just a little tiny bit of Russia detached. There's Belarus and uh, Lithuania and Latvia in between, um, but that belongs to Russia, and she uses it. She's got naval bases there. In fact, she puts in ships with uh, missiles which are capable of reaching the whole of Europe, based there. So, a uh, very strategic base uh, as far as Russia is concerned. Moving, again, going back on the map there, so she's been working in Georgia. Uh, further down in Armenia, in last year and this year, again strengthening uh, ties with Armenia and putting in bases there, so she's got troops in Armenia. Uh, in the region of Syria, uh, she has the use of a base in Iran, the temporary use of a base in Iran. She has use of facilities in Cyprus. She has a navy in the uh, sea uh, around uh, Cyprus. And uh, she has her two main bases in Syria, on the coast there, we'll just look at the map there. So she's very active in this region to the north of Israel because his destination eventually is to go down to Israel. So in Syria, I see the time has just about gone, so Syria, uh, those are the two bases. She's now got uh, agreements with uh, Syria that they are under the complete control of Russia she has 49-year lease extended automatically for 25 years. Great amounts of money being poured into uh, those bases there. If we just go along the top here, at the moment he is negotiating with the Libyan leader that controls the eastern part of Libya to use two of the ports there. Um, uh, let's just skip this because it, with time is flowing, but that's the... Uh, Haftar is a very pro-Russian man, uh, and if Russia can agree for use of ports there, then that will be a great boost. But Egypt has already given uh, an old Soviet based uh, camp, uh, so the Russians use that already, and at the moment negotiations are ongoing with Russia to be able to use any of Russian uh, any of Egypt's bases by Russian forces. It's interesting how uh, Russia ha is working in Egypt. She's also negotiating down in the south there with Sudan to have a base there. And so we can see how uh, Russia is reaping the benefit of what she was doing in Syria to extend her control not only into Syria, but to work onwards into northern Africa. So not only does she have Europe encircled, but she also has um, Israel uh, encircled. And Russia is the number two arms exporter. Uh, America is number one, Russia is number two, and a lot of it goes into the Middle East. She's beginning to build up with Saudi Arabia and with Russia. So it's interesting how the old ties um, are going back. So we, we've seen this huge expansion of Russia's footprint, moving further southwards, round the Mediterranean, like Turkey encircled. Uh, we can be sure that eventually Turkey will fall to Russia. Friendly with Iran, Persia, uh, all the steps that scripture would lead us to expect. And all this is happening uh, while in the West we've got this Brexit earthquake uh, and a Trump earthquake. But we'll bring those in next time round. Thank you.